So, brothers and sisters, please open up your Bibles to the book of Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 23. Same as last week. So, last week we spoke about Passover, didn't we? It was Passover and how that the Passover is fulfilled in the crucifixion, the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus Christ. We explained that these Western terms, such as Easter, all this comes from Babylon. Easter, of course, is the uh, Latinization of Ishtar. Ishtar was the Babylonian goddess of fertility, which is why you have the symbols of the bunny and the egg. It all comes from Babylon. It all comes from the Babylonian goddess of fertility, Ishtar. The biblical Easter, the biblical celebration is, of course, Passover, which has now come to an end. However, we're going to be looking at the second aspect of Passover, which is known as the Feast of First Fruits. Not a feast which is spoken about a lot now in, um, in Judaism, because the temple no longer exists. It hasn't existed since 70 AD. However, the significance of the Feast of First Fruits is very important, as it's fulfilled in the resurrection. So the Passover, the Passover lamb is fulfilled in the crucifixion of the Messiah, and the Feast of First Fruits is fulfilled in the resurrection of the Messiah. Again, a pivotal point of the Passover week and also a pivotal point of our faith as well, our faith in Jesus. It's in the resurrection, isn't it? The, our faith hinges on the resurrection of the Messiah. Now, in this chapter here, Leviticus 23, I've explained this last week, so apologies for those who already know this, but God gave seven feasts for Israel to observe, seven annual feasts to be celebrated, and the Messiah comes to fulfill all of these feasts, they all have a future meaning in the Messiah. They all celebrate something in Israel's past. For example, the Passover celebrates the coming out of Egypt, doesn't it? The blood of the lamb upon the lintels on the doorposts. And also it's fulfilled in the crucifixion of the Messiah. And also all the other feasts have these past meanings, these past commemorations, but they all have that future meaning as well to be fulfilled in the Messiah. There's those first four feasts, isn't there? The first four feasts are fulfilled in the first coming of the Messiah, the spring feasts, which we're in right now. Then there's that gap, that gap, that summer, that long hot summer, which corresponds to the time of the Gentiles. And then you have the autumn feasts, which are fulfilled at the Messiah's second coming. So the Messiah comes to fulfill the first four feasts at his first coming. He then returns to fulfill the final three feasts. This is how we must understand this chapter here in Leviticus 23. All of these feasts have that past meaning, but they all have that future meaning as well. God also modelled these feasts around the agricultural cycle, the agricultural year in Israel. You have the spring harvest which takes place, then you have, after the summer, the autumn harvest which takes place. The spring harvest is, an autumn, is, is a uh, harvest of wheat, they harvest the wheat. Then after the summer, they then have the autumn harvest, which is a harvest of fruit. That's when they harvest all the fruit. So God kind of modelled these feasts around that agricultural cycle. The Feast of Weeks, for example, Shavuot in Hebrew, it's the Feast of Pentecost, that takes place at the time of the spring harvest. That's why they read the Book of Ruth in the synagogues, because in Book of Ruth, Ruth is there at the time of the harvest, isn't she? Gleaning in the field, in Ruth chapter 2. So, before the harvest, before the main spring harvest, 50 days before this, we have this feast known as the Feast of First Fruits. So, Leviticus 23, we're going to be going from verse 9 through to verse 14. Leviticus 23, verses 9 to 14. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, When you come into the land which I give to you, and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And you shall offer on that day, when you wave the sheaf, a male lamb of the first year without blemish as a burnt offering to the Lord. Its grain offering shall be two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil and an offering made by fire to the Lord for a sweet aroma. And its drink offering shall be of wine, one fourth of a hin. You shall eat neither bread nor parched grain nor fresh grain until the same day that you have brought an offering to your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. So this Feast of First Fruits, what it looks back to, it looks back to the fruitfulness of the land of Israel, the fruitfulness of the promised land which God was bringing the Jews into. Remember, many times in the Bible we see that God is going to bring the Israelites into the promised land, a land flowing with halav vi milk and honey. It's a term we see a lot in the Hebrew Bible. 
milk and honey, a land flowing with milk and honey. There's many other prophecies in the Bible, especially in Ezekiel and Isaiah, about the land of Israel um, yielding fruit in the last days, filling the world with fruit. So it's the fruitfulness of the land, which again, which is probably why it's the most coveted piece of land in the world, isn't it? Now, as I said, there's two harvests, one which takes place in the spring, one which takes place in the autumn. The spring harvest is a harvest of grain, wheat, and the autumn harvest is a harvest of fruit. And you tend to have two rainy seasons before each of those harvests as well. Now, the harvest, as I said, doesn't take place until Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, which is 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits. Now, during the feast, on the day of First Fruits, on the Feast of First Fruits, what the high priest would do is, the high priest would go out into the Kidron Valley. The Kidron Valley is that valley which separates the Temple Mount from the Mount of Olives. You know, the Mount of Olives where Jesus ascended from and where he's returning to as well. You have know, a big valley there in between the Mount of Olives and the Temple Mount. The high priest would go out into the Kidron Valley and he would ceremonially harvest the first ripe grain which is appearing out of the earth. Remember, the harvest isn't for another 50 days. So 50 days the harvest would take place, but he would harvest the first grain which was beginning to appear out of the earth. He would do this on the Feast of First Fruits. He would then bring this grain into the temple, they'd have this waving ceremony, in Hebrew it's known as Tenufat HaOmer, it literally means the waving of the sheaf, Omer is sheaf in Hebrew, and he would wave it before the Lord to be accepted by the Lord. Now going back to the text of Leviticus 23, there's two issues I want to highlight. The first one is the question of terminology. What is this feast known as in Hebrew? The most common term that you'll hear for the name of this feast is Yom Habikurim. It literally means the day of first fruits. Yom Habikurim. However, it is actually a big error and misconception that this feast is called Yom Habikurim in Hebrew. The reason for that is the term that you see in God's instructions for the Feast of Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. We see that term used, Yom Habikurim, we see that term used later on in Leviticus. However, it's not the term which is used here for the Feast of First Fruits. Yes, Shavuot takes place at the time of the spring harvest, but we see that when God gave the Feast of Shavuot, it says, You shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you bought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed, 49 days. Count 50 days until the day after the seventh Sabbath, then you shall offer a new grain offering. So there's a separate offering which takes place at the time of Shavuot. You shall bring from your dwellings two loaves of one, two tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour. They are first fruits to the Lord. Now the term that we see there is Yom Habikurim first fruits. It's not the term which was used back in Leviticus 23 from verse 9. In Leviticus 23 10 when it says when you come into the land which I give to you and reap its harvest then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of the harvest to the priest. The term there is Rashid Katsir. Rashid Katsir. That's the correct biblical name for the feast of first fruits. Rashid means beginning the book of Genesis in Hebrew in, is called Bereshit. It literally means in the beginning. That's how the book of Genesis starts, in the beginning, Bereshit. And Katsir is harvest. So the correct biblical term for this feast is Reshit Katsir. It's not a term that you'll hear used often for this feast. There are some purists out there who use the, uh, the correct term, but the most common term you'll hear is Yom Habikurim. But just know that that is an error, that is a misconception. The second issue, that I want to highlight is exactly when did this feast take place. The issue that we have is that God doesn't actually give the date for this feast. He simply says the day after the Sabbath. Now what does that mean? In the other feasts that he gives, Feast of Trumpets, Feast of Tabernacles, Passover, he gives the specific date, 14th of Nisan, 1st of Tishrei, 15th of Tishrei, all these feasts were given dates. However, when it comes to first fruits, the date actually isn't given, it's just the day after the Sabbath. So there's two possibilities as to when this actually is. The first possibility is it's talking about the day after the Sabbath which follows Passover. So imagine you have Passover which falls on a Tuesday. It's talking about that following Sabbath, the following Saturday, and the day after that, which of course will be the Sunday. That's the first possibility. And that is the, uh, held, that is the view which was held by the Sadducees. That's the view that the Sadducees held to. Jesus argued with the Sadducees many times about this sort of thing. The second possibility 
is that when it says the day after the Sabbath, the Sabbath that it's talking about there is the high Sabbath of Passover. Now, Passover is a high Sabbath in Hebrew, Shabbat Gadol, it literally means high Sabbath. So, it could fall on any day of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, whenever, but it would be regarded as a Sabbath, a high Sabbath. And therefore, the Pharisees held to the viewpoint that that's talking about the high Sabbath of Passover, not necessarily the Sabbath which follows Passover. So there's two schools of thought there. When I began studying this kind of stuff, my initial thought was it's talking about the Sabbath which follows Passover. Therefore, it could fall on, it could fall on Sunday. It falls, always falls on a Sunday. However, the date is a variable because if Passover falls on a Tuesday, for example, then you have another five days to wait till the Sabbath. If Passover fell on a Friday, then it's only two days, which makes the date a variable. As I said, there's no date given for this particular feast. Therefore, that's what led me to believe that it's talking about the day which follows, uh, the, the Sabbath which follows Passover. Now, in the year that Jesus was crucified, it was both. The Sabbath happened to be on Passover, and Passover happened to fall on the Sabbath. Remember, they got Jesus' body down off the cross, didn't they? Because the Sabbath was about to begin. So, in the year that Jesus was crucified, it was both. That's why it's difficult to figure this out. We know, however, that the Feast of First Fruits was the next day, which was the Sunday, first day of the week, Yom Rishon in Hebrew. It's always first day. And that's when Jesus rose from the dead. So that's my personal view. I'm not saying that's exactly how it is. I guess uh, I'm still figuring that one out, and so are many other people as well. But it's my understanding that it's talking about the Sabbath which follows Passover, which makes the Feast of First Fruits a variable. The commonly accepted date is the 16th of Nisan for the Feast of First Fruits. But whether it's the day after the Sabbath, or whether it's the day after the High Sabbath of Passover, it tells us in the Gospels that Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week, Yom Rishon, the Feast of First Fruits, and this is what, fulfill, this is what fulfills the Feast of First Fruits, his resurrection. On the Feast of First Fruits, as I said, the high priest would go out into the uh, Kidron Valley, he would harvest the first grain of crops that began to appear out of the earth, he'd go into the temple and offer it. Now he would wait for these first pin of sunlight to appear, before he harvested these first ripe crops, he would wait for the first pin of sunlight to appear over the horizon, and that's when he would harvest the crops. Now, it tells us in all four Gospels that Jesus rose from the dead at sunrise. This means that Jesus doesn't just fulfill these feasts to the day, he fulfills them to the very moment, just like Passover, when we spoke about Passover last week. At the very moment that those Passover lambs were being sacrificed at the temple, Jesus was dying on the cross saying, it is finished. He doesn't just fulfill them to the day, he fulfills them to the moment. And it's the same for first fruits. At the very moment that the high priest was out there in the Kidron Valley harvesting those first ripe crops, Jesus was rising from the dead in the tomb at that very moment, sunrise. The priest would wait for that sunrise to appear. And at that very moment, Jesus was rising from the dead. And then 50 days later, we have the Feast of Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, which we'll be uh, talking more about in 50 days time but we're not quite that far ahead yet. But Jesus said in Matthew 13, verse 39, in the parable of the wheat and the tares, Jesus said that the harvest has to do with the end of the world, the resurrection, the end of time. This is what the harvest in the Bible points to. It points to the end of time, the end of the world, the resurrection. Now, Jesus argued with the Sadducees about this topic, about the resurrection. In Matthew 22, he has a debate with the Sadducees about the resurrection, doesn't he? And this is why, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul describes Jesus as the first fruits of the resurrection. Why? Because the resurrection has already begun. It began with Jesus. It's going to end with us. We are all going to rise from the dead. We are all going to receive new bodies. We're going to receive bodies that are going to be immortal, not going to get tired, not going to get sick, and never going to die, just like Jesus did. So in 1 Corinthians 15, this is when we see if you turn to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, this is where we see Paul describing Jesus as the first fruits of the resurrection, the end times resurrection which is coming, which we are all going to experience. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. Remember, there's that big harvest which is coming at the end. But then there's that first fruits offering which is given before. 
which this Paul here describes Jesus as the fulfillment of. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, those who have died. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in, all, in, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, that's very important there, each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards those who are Christ's at his coming. In other words, Christ is the first to rise from the dead. After that, it will be all of us at the end. All of us will also rise from the dead with him. But Christ is the first fruits. He is the beginning of the resurrection. And if we go forward to verse 50, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50, this is where Paul describes our resurrection, our raising from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50 to 55. Now I say... This, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These bodies that you have right now, they cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. Very significant there, the trumpet is to do with the resurrection, isn't it? For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. In other words, we're going to get rid of these bodies that we're in now, and God is going to give us a brand new body which is immortal and which will never corrupt. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Now, Paul there is quoting two passages. He's made a prophecy there out of two passages from the Old Testament. He's quoting Isaiah 25, 8, and he's also quoting Hosea 13, verse 4. So he's put those together there to say, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? In other words, death is going to be defeated. We see the fulfillment of this in Revelation chapter 20, the book of Revelation chapter 20 verses 4 to 6. And I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him for a thousand years. So Christ is risen from the dead. He's going to reign from Jerusalem. We are also going to rise from the dead and we are going to reign with him. It's not just Christ who reigns, it's actually us who reign with him as kings and priests in the kingdom of God. So his resurrection will be our resurrection. His resurrection body will be our resurrection body. We'll have the same body that Christ had when he rose from the dead, a body which will never die again. When you see people like Lazarus, who Jesus rose from the dead, he went to die a second time, didn't he? He would die a second time. That wasn't the resurrection that Jesus is speaking about here. The resurrection of Lazarus was a type, of course, of the resurrection of the end times, but Lazarus died a second time, didn't he? But the resurrection that we will experience in the last days will be an everlasting resurrection from the dead, where we will never die again, just as Christ rose from the dead as the first fruits. This is what it says in Philippians, in Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 to 21. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. In other words, the, the body that Jesus had when he rose from the dead is the exact body that we are going to receive when we rise from the dead on the day of the resurrection. Now, that's what awaits us. That's what awaits us in the kingdom. Joel Osteen says, your best life is now. You ever heard of that book of his, your best life now? No, our best life is going to be in the kingdom of God when we reign with Yeshua as kings and priests. If you follow Joel Osteen, then I'll say, yeah, your best life is now because your next life's going to be in hell. So there's a resurrection coming, but that resurrection has already begun with Yeshua as the first fruits. And of course, the resurrection of the Messiah, this was always reflected in the disciples' preaching. 
You read the book of Acts, whenever they were evangelizing, whether it's Paul, Peter or John or whoever, they were always testifying to the resurrection. They were always saying, this Jesus, who we preach to you now, he rose from the dead. That was always the pivotal point of their preaching, the resurrection. Yes, he died for, for our sin, but he rose from the dead and he is alive now. This is always what they are preaching. And this must be reflected in our evangelism too. When we go out there and preach the gospel, when we tell Jesus, when we tell people about this Jesus who died for our sin to give us eternal life, we must be doing what the disciples did. He rose from the dead and he's alive now, seated at the right hand of God the Father. He's alive. This began with Peter on the day of Pentecost. Shavuot. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Now this is what we're speaking more about when it comes to the Feast of Weeks in the early June, early June I believe it is, this year. Feast of Weeks, Shavuot, it's fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, this is when the Holy Spirit came, isn't it? The Holy Spirit was given and this is when the disciples began to preach the Gospel. No preaching took place until the Holy Spirit had come to empower the church to preach the Gospel. Remember, when we go out preaching, do not think it's anything of your own. It's the power of the Holy Spirit which is enabling you to preach the Gospel. That power will be taken from us one day, but that's another topic. Acts chapter 2, verses 22 to 32. Now look what Peter gets to straight away. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, now Peter begins here to quote Psalm 16. This is where this passage comes from, Psalm 16. David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the path of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. So Peter there is quoting Psalm 16, specifically verses 8 to 11. In other words, what he's going to say now is, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, obviously David wrote Psalm 16, didn't he? The patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. In other words, what Peter is saying here is that this psalm isn't talking about David. David wrote this psalm in the first person, but what he's saying here is that this psalm isn't talking about David because David is dead and buried and his tomb is with us here to this day. He's saying it's talking about the Messiah. It's talking about Jesus. His tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ. He's saying here that the Psalm 16 is talking about the resurrection of Christ. You will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. And then he goes on to say, This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. They witnessed the resurrection of Christ, didn't they? Now it's interesting because in Greek the word for witness is martis. Martis is where we get the word martyr from. Because they were all martyred for their witness of the resurrection. They witnessed the resurrection. They were going around saying that this Jesus was no longer dead, but he's now alive. And they were martyred for this, weren't they? They were put to death for their testimony that Jesus had rose from the dead. So the resurrection idea was already foretold in the Old Testament. The Jews often say, the unbelieving Jews often say that the resurrection of the Messiah is not a Jewish idea, it's, an, it's a Christian invention. However, we know that that is not true because it says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 4, that basic gospel message, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, the Old Testament prophecies, and that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. Jesus also says this in Luke 24, when Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to the disciples, didn't he? Luke 24, verses 44 to 46. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you whilst I was still with you, 
that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, the Old Testament, the Tanakh is called in Hebrew, concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ, the Messiah, to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. He's saying the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, prophesied that the Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. Where do we get this third day idea from in the Old Testament? Unbelieving Jews tell us it's a Christian invention. However, where does it come from in the Old Testament? Think about Isaac and Abraham. Abraham was told to offer up Isaac as an offering. How long was the journey for? Go to Mount Moriah. How long was that journey for? Three days, Genesis 22. In the mind of Abraham, his son was dead. His son was as good as dead. So for three days, Abraham knew or thought that his son was dead. And this is what it tells us in Hebrews. Again, the best commentary on the Old Testament is the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 11 says, talking about Abraham and Isaac here, Therefore from one man, Isaac, and him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the, mul of the sky in the multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. To him as good as dead. Isaac was as good as dead in that three day period, wasn't he? And then God said, don't lay a hand on him. That's a picture of the resurrection. Three days there. Where else do we get this idea of three days from? How long was Jonah in the belly of the whale for? Three days and three nights. Jesus tells us in Matthew 12, verse 40, that this is a type of the resurrection. It's a foreshadowing of the resurrection. Matthew 12, verse 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He's saying there is a type of the resurrection. The Pharisees said, show us a sign. And he said, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, but I'll give you no sign other than the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That's what he's alluding to here. There's other types of resurrection in the Bible, in the Old Testament as well. We see a type of the resurrection in uh, the book of Genesis, chapter 37, with Joseph. What happened to Joseph? His brothers cast him into the cistern, the pit. A cistern is like a, like a well. He cast, they cast him into the, uh, into the cistern, didn't they? But then when Reuben went back to look for him, he'd gone. And then they took his coat, you know, that coat of many colours, they took his coat to his father and said, he's gone, we've only got his coat. Well, that's what happened with Jesus. They took the linen garments that they found in the tomb, didn't they? And said, he's not there. All there was was the garments. We see the same thing in Jeremiah 38 with Jeremiah. What happened to Jeremiah? Same thing. He was cast into the system, wasn't he? He was cast into the system because he was saying, long story short, that the Babylonians are going to come and overrun Jerusalem. The kings were saying, no, we're going to stand and we're going to conquer the Babylonians. But Jeremiah was cast into the system for prophesying negative prophecies basically he was cast into the cistern he sank down in the mud and then this guy Ebed Melech and 30 other guys came to rescue him out of the cistern again Jeremiah coming out of the cistern is a picture of Jesus coming out of the tomb it's the same thing we see in the book of Daniel in Daniel chapter 6 where was Daniel thrown to the lion's den he was thrown into the lion's den wasn't he again because of a conspiracy against him he was thrown into the lion's den, and what's interesting is if you read Daniel 6, they put a stone over the entrance to the lion's den, didn't they? Again, it's a foreshadowing of what happened to Jesus. And then Daniel emerges alive from the lion's den. Joseph emerged from the pit, Jeremiah emerged from the cistern, Daniel emerged from the lion's den, all foreshadowing Yeshua emerging alive from the tomb. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. The resurrection of Christ is what our faith hinges on. If there's no resurrection, if there's no resurrection, then Jesus can't pay for anyone's sins. He can pay for the world's sins because he rose from the dead. This is what our faith hinges on. This is the pivotal point of our Christian faith. Now, going back to 1 Corinthians 15, again, a passage about the resurrection, it can only be understood that, there, that Paul here was addressing people in the Corinthian church who had a Sadducee background. There were Jews who had various different backgrounds, and the Sadducees were known for not believing in the resurrection of the dead. If you read Matthew 22 again, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. And this is what Paul is addressing here in 1 Corinthians 15. 
And in verse 12, this is basically what Paul is saying about how our faith is basically dead if there's no resurrection. If Christ didn't rise from the dead, then our faith is pointless and it's dead. This is what he's saying here in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 12 to 20. Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Again, in other words, if Christ is not risen, then your faith is dead. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up. If in fact the dead do not rise, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. And, if, and you are still in your sins. There you go. Christ cannot pay for anyone's sins if he didn't rise from the dead. And of course, because this is what our faith hinges on, that's what gets attacked the most, isn't it? The resurrection. The resurrection is the most contested event in human history. Why? Because if it's true, that means Christ has died for the sins of the world. If it's not true, he's not died for anyone's sins. This is why it's the most contested event in history. We often hear these attacks against the Gospels, don't we? The attacks against the resurrection narrative. They say, oh, but there's many contradictions in the Gospel narrative. The, go the Gospels contradict themselves, don't they? Well, that's not true whatsoever. It tells us in John 20, verse 1, as St. Tommy read, that Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and discovered that the tomb was empty. In Matthew 28, verse 1, it tells us Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went. In Mark 16, verse 1, it tells us Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome went. In Luke 24, verse 10, it says that Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them went to the tomb. Now, these are called contradictions. They're not contradictions at all. A contradiction would be Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and no one else went. And the other gospel says Mary Magdalene and Mary and, jo and Joanna there you've got a contradiction. But the fact that it says that basically a group of women went to the tomb and found the tomb empty, that's not a contradiction. These are in harmony with one another. It just gives you different names from it. There's no contradiction here whatsoever. It's like the police taking a statement. Say you've got a car crash which happened outside this building. They take statements from witnesses, don't they? They'd expect those statements to not be exactly the same. If they're exactly the same, then that wouldn't stand up in court. That wouldn't stand up in court whatsoever. They're too similar. They would expect there to be some differences. Someone might say it was a big, it was, it was a, it was a big black car, and another person might say it was a Range Rover. They're not contradicting each other, are they? One's being more specific than the other. And that's exactly how it is in the Gospels. The Gospels don't contradict each other, they complement each other. This is exactly what we'd expect to see in any witness statement. And of course they say that the, gospel, the, the uh, resurrection of Christ is not found in the history books. Well, that's completely wrong. Read Josephus, Flavius Josephus, Antiqu Antiquities of the Jews. I'll gladly lend you a copy if you like. He talks about the resurrection of Christ. He talks about how this Christ had risen from the dead. Pontius Pilate used to write a report back to Rome. This is what these, uh, these um, procurators would have to do. They'd have to write reports back to Rome, to the emperor. And in one of his reports, it's known as the Acti Pilati. I've got a copy of it as well, which I'll gladly lend you. It's called the Acts of Pilate. He mentions about this Jesus who was put to death, and then there was people going around saying that he had risen from the dead. Again, it's in other historical sources. It's not just in the Bible. And of course, there's many theories that have been conjured up as to why the tomb was empty, as to why the body had gone. The most common theory you'll hear is that the disciples stole the body. You mean to tell me they stole the body and then suffered a brutal martyrdom for something which they knew was a lie? No way. No way did they go to their deaths knowing that there was a lie all along. No way. That would stand up in court. That's something that would stand up in court, all right? Many theories. I won't go through them all. The most common one is that the body was stolen. Of course, if they stole a the body, they also took the effort to unwrap very expensive linens and leave those linens behind. You wouldn't leave expensive linens behind in the tomb like that, perfectly folded up. It's absolute rubbish. In all the theories and possibilities presented to explain the empty tomb, the only possibility is that Jesus rose from the dead. It's not just one of the possibilities, it's the only possibility. Famous quote from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes. One of his quotes is, 
When you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however impossible, must be the truth. And that's exactly how it is in the tomb. Once you eliminate that which is impossible, that which remains, regardless of how improbable, must be the truth. And the idea that Jesus rose from the dead must be the truth because it is the only possibility. I'm going to introduce you to a guy called Lionel Luckhu. Many of you know who he is. He's the world's most successful lawyer. Lionel Luckhu, the world's most successful lawyer. He's in the Guinness Book of Records for 245 consecutive victories out of 245 cases. World's most successful lawyer. He spent years studying the resurrection and putting the facts and evidence through the same scrutiny as you would do through a court of law. Again, it's all done through the eyes of a lawyer. And this is the conclusion he came to in his book. I humbly add I have spent more than 42 years as a defence trial lawyer, appearing in many parts of the world, and I am still active in practice. I have been fortunate to secure a number of successes in jury trials, and I say unequivocally the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming that it compels acceptance by proof which leaves absolutely no room for doubt. In a court of law, there must be no room for doubt, mustn't there? And that's from his book, The Question Answered, Did Jesus Rise from the Dead? That's the conclusion of the world's most successful lawyer, after examining the evidence, examining the facts with due consideration. Now, of course, if you were to measure this up against the Quran, for example, Muslims say that Jesus never rose from the dead. It's the most contested thing in history, isn't it? And the Muslims are the ones who go after it the most. They say he never rose from the dead because he never died in the first place. Again, another theory. He never died in the first place. Well, the thing is, if you used to put the Quran through a court of law, they say this is written 600 years after the events. In John chapter 19, you have an eyewitness. John was an eyewitness to these things. In John chapter 19, verses 34 to 35, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he's telling the truth so that you may believe. In other words, there's a not coincidence why this is in the Gospel of John, because John was the eyewitness to these things. He saw Jesus pierced with that side. So if you to put these things in a court of law, who are you going to believe? A paedophile who lived 600 years after Christ? Or an eyewitness who was there at the cross? It wouldn't even stand a chance. The court wouldn't even look at it. This is how overwhelming the evidence is for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 There's over... 4,000 religions in the world, brothers and sisters. Over 4,000 religions. How many empty tombs are there? One. Only one of those has a cross and one of those has an empty tomb. There is only one empty tomb. 4,000 religions, one empty tomb. Mohammed is dead. Buddha is dead. Joseph Smith is dead. Every Pope is dead. Jesus Christ is alive. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Jesus is alive, seated at the right hand of God the Father, and he is getting ready to judge the living and the dead. He is the first fruits of the resurrection, and you and I are going to follow him, brothers and sisters. We are going to follow him. We are going to rise from the dead. We are going to receive eternal bodies that will never get sick, never get hungry, never get tired, never get old, never get overweight, and they will live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. It's Christ who reigns, and we reign with him as kings and priests. Hallelujah. Let us give glory to God and go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much, Lord, for this day. We thank you for bringing us together to worship you and to expound upon your word. Lord, we do thank you above all that not only did your dear son come to die for our sins and take our place in death, but also that he rose from the dead and conquered death and that we now have that same hope of the resurrection, that we too, even though we may suffer persecution, even though we may suffer martyrdom, we too will experience that resurrection from the dead where we will never die again, where we will never be under any pain, that you will wipe away every tear. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that, that life awaits us, our citizenship hidden, Lord, in heaven with you. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for that great hope that we have. And Lord, that you've called us to go out there and proclaim that hope to the world, to tell others that Christ has died for their sins and that God is no longer imputing sins to the world. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for choosing us to be ambassadors of Jesus Christ and to go out there and proclaim the good news, the good news of the resurrection of the dead, the good news that we too can have that hope that we will rise from the dead with Christ. 
And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that we worship a true, living, eternal God. We know, Lord, that your word says four times that other gods are demons, other gods are dead. We know, Heavenly Father, that we serve a true, eternal, living God, that there is only one true God, one true Saviour, and his name is Yeshua HaMashiach, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Glory to God.